Jonah chapter 4, and I'm going to start at verse 5 and go through the verse 11. Jonah chapter 4, starting at verse 5. And as we go through these six verses, there's going to be a theme here that the author is going to uh, reflect back on Genesis, which is really important as we go through this. But please listen carefully, for this is God's word. Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God had appointed a plant and made, and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant, so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant, which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night, and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. So the author, he starts right out, and uh, the people that were reading this, when this first came out, would recognize what I'm about to say, these three different things. But the first thing is in verse 5, it says, Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city. And what that brings up is Genesis. Because remember with uh, Adam and Eve, when they were expelled from the garden and went east of paradise. Cain's departure from Yahweh's presence, he ended up settling east of Eden. And you've probably heard of that uh, saying before, east of Eden. The builders of Babel, in the process of migrating east, they decided to stop and build that monument. That's in Genesis 11.2. In Genesis 13.11, remember when Lot separated from Abraham? And he, where did he end up? East, living in Sodom and Gomorrah. So what the author's pointing out is that Jonah is once again starting to drift away from the Lord, drift from the will of God. And it, right there in verse 5, he uses another word. He says, made a booth for himself there. And that's not the same exact word as the booths that they made in the desert wanderings for 40 years. But it's a, it's a root word. And so Jonah, what the author is making pains at, is that he's outside of the will of God. And he's acting like the Israelites that because of their disobedience, they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness, uh, living in huts. But he goes, and he also says, he wants us to remember, that remember what the sea represented for Israel. Chaos. Uh, they, they dreaded the sea in those days. And Jonah's first encounter with God was on the sea. Now he's going to encounter him again in the wilderness. So those two metaphors, the sea and wilderness, is pointing to, to Jonah's disobedience. But what we have here is we have to remember that despite Jonah's transformation, he has been used greatly by God. I can't emphasize that more. And the more I ponder this for the last week, the more I'm going to miss Jonah, to be honest with you. Because all of us have a little Jonah in all of us. And if we don't, there's something wrong. And let me explain. Jonah has a deep, deep, intimate relationship with the God of Israel. He is his prophet. He's been used mightily. And now he has these stumbling blocks that the Lord has put in his path because he wants Jonah to grow even deeper with him. Nobody will ever be perfect in this life. Nobody's ever going to have it all together when it comes to the Lord. 
And the only way we grow and learn is that we come through disobedience. Whenever we fall away, we get back up and we keep going. Or when the Lord exposes our motives, whatever's lodged in there and, and reveals it to us, we act on it. We say, Lord, change me. This is what's happened with Jonah. It is a sign of grace. That, that this is happening because Jonah's about ready to go through the best counseling session anybody's ever been through. You know, in, in verse 6, it says, well, I guess it's still verse 5. He sat under it in the shade, talking about the booth, till he should see what would become of the city. And right there, um, the Lord starting to expose his motives. But let me get to verse 6. Now the Lord appointed a plant and made it come over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. And that word discomfort is, it means evil, calamity, disaster. And the author has used this word several times throughout Jonah. And what, what the author's pointing out is Jonah's physical misery in the heat as well as his eternal evil motives that he has. Because what Jonah is doing is he's sitting outside the city waiting to see if this repentance is going to take. He hopes it's, it doesn't. He hopes it's a false repentance and that God's going to destroy his arch enemies, Nineveh. That's what Jonah is, is counting on, relying on. And, it, and with those motives, jo Jonah is no better than Nineveh. Because he's lodging the same hatred and disregard of human welfare that Nineveh did, right? And I'm sorry to say, but we are held to a higher standard as Christians. I was talking to Ken on, on the breakfast Wednesday, and he was 100% right. We go by the Ten Commandments, but worse than that, it goes even deeper than the Ten Commandments. Because Jesus says, if you even lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. So even though the sin isn't as great as Nineveh's, because they actually went out and tortured and, and killed people and demolished villages, the Lord's saying, Jonah, you're no better. because You have this hatred in your heart towards me having mercy on this city. And that leads me to one of my first points. I'll just say this really fast. Sometimes in this life, well, Sylvia brought up about friendships when we cultivate friendships in life. You know, everybody in this room, we're friends, especially in Jesus Christ. But we have certain friends that we know even more. At the same time, when we meet another Christian, and we just know them superficially, may run into them once or twice, and we see them living a life that we don't think they should live, let me put it out, I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> we only know them from afar. And sometimes it's hard for us to distinguish between a saved Christian and somebody that's obviously not saved. I'm telling you. It's because we don't know that person to begin with, but we're making judgments. But anyway, the point I'm getting at is the only thing that makes a difference between a, a Christian that's disobedient and a non-believer is the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ that resides on that person. And it doesn't happen often. But all I'm going to say is on Judgment Day, we're going to be surprised at some of the people that are in heaven. And that's why, once again, because we can't see the imputed righteousness of Christ on somebody. Only God sees that. But there's going to be a day when we get to heaven, there's going to be people, oh, I didn't think you were going to be here. That only happens once in a while. And, and I, I, all I have to say about that is that's why for your loved ones, live a life that glorifies Christ. So that if they pass before you, you have a good idea, you pretty much know they're in heaven. Anyway, I want to go off that topic for a minute. Because in verse 6 again, it says, now the Lord God. It's Elohim Yehovah. And in the Hebrew, it's what I'm going to say in a couple of these things here in the Hebrew, it just stands out. We can't really see in the English, but when the people read this, they were picked right up on this. Why is the author changing the name to Lord God? And then he talks about appointing a plant. And what the Lord, this is the beginning of his counseling session. What the Lord is showing Jonah is he's referring back to Genesis chapter 2. When, when he called, God says to Adam and Eve, I'm the Lord God. And in that garden, remember what God did. 
he, he furnished all the shrubbery, all the plants, all the trees. Adam and Eve didn't. They were told to take care of it after God had planted the garden. So God's doing the same thing here to Jonah. He's the one that planted the, the plant that grew up overnight to give Jonah comfort. And I think people would pick up on that. He's referring back to Genesis chapter 2. But more than that, he'd be, he's also saying to Jonah that before I was the God of Israel, I was the God of the world. Before Abraham. Right? He was a God that saved no one. And though they had universal compassion of everybody. He still does. He always has. But Jonah needs to understand. He's going back to Genesis talking about the universal compassion of God. And that's what he wants Jonah to understand. I'm having a universal compassion. I have universal compassion for Nineveh. Not just Israel. And that's what Jonah needs to understand. But in verse 7 it says... I need glasses. Uh, so Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. And then in verse 7, But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. So what, what's about to happen here is God is going to show Jonah Jonah's about ready to experience the very scenario that he wanted to happen to Nineveh. And that's the withdrawal of mercy and the execution of justice. That's what Jonah wanted on Nineveh. And what God's going to do here, he's gentle. He loves Jonah, he's very gentle with him. But you see, Jonah's out there baking in the heat. And so God, he, he builds a hut. That's a picture of him trying to do it through his own human wisdom and strength, trying to provide for himself, but that hut isn't good enough. So God provides a plant to give Jonah comfort from the heat. And he's glad. He's happy for that plant. But now God's going to take that plant away from him. And he's like, as if he's giving him a lesson, I'm going to start withdrawing my mercy and I'm going to execute justice on you, just what you wanted to happen to Nineveh. And then in verse 8, it says, uh, When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die, and said, It's better for me to die than to live. Okay, that, there's only one other place, we're going to get to this in a minute, there's only one other place in the Old Testament where somebody wished to die, and that was Elijah. And when we go through Elijah, several verses, you're going to see how it's contrasting with what's happening here. But notice what Jonah's doing. He's in the midst of suffering, misery. And he mutters to himself, is what it says, I wish I would just die. He's not saying it to the Lord. He said it to the Lord, chapter 1. But he's not saying it now. He's saying, muttering to himself, I wish I was dead. And what's happening is Jonah's turning inward. He's turning inward. God's always turning outward. He's always, God is always caring and turning outward for his whole creation. Jonah's starting to turn inward. And God's not going to allow that to happen because he loves Jonah. Because in verse 9, it says, But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? So, God's confronting Jonah. He's not going to let him be isolated and in himself. He's going to bring him out of his inward, and he's going to start talking to Jonah. And Jonah replies, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And then the Lord says at that point, Jonah, this is another thing he wants him to learn. You're angry over this one, this plant that I gave you out of my grace that you only knew for one day. I've known Nineveh. I've been taking care of them ever since they were born. I've been invested interest in the whole creation. I'm actively working in creation. I've known these people. I've been with them ever since they've been born. 60, 70, 80 years. So how can, do you think your attachment for a plant that you only knew one day is as good, is as great or greater than mine that I have been wanting these people to be saved? 
kind of foolish, isn't it? Then the Lord, he says, in verse 10, And the Lord said, You pity the plant which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in the night, and perished in the night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know the right hand from the left, and also much cow. That's a Hebrew idiom. And I want to get into depression and, and uh, Elijah, but when you, this, that is, phrase is only used three times in the Old Testament. I know there's been different views of what that phrase means. But what that phrase means is referring to Nineveh, who has many people who are entrapped in their sinful lifestyles and don't know how to get out. Because when you go to 2 Samuel 1955, I'm going to go ahead and read this. This is the only three places in Scripture that this is used, this phrase. And this will give you a good idea what, what that idiom means. In 2 Samuel 1935, it says... In 2 Samuel 19.35, he says, I am this day 80 years old. Can I discern what is pleasant and what is not? Can your servant taste what he eats or what he drinks? Can I still listen to the voice of singing men and singing women? So this is Barzalia who helped David when he escaped. And David said, come with us after he's getting restored, his kingdom is being restored to him, and I'll take care of you. And he says, don't ever worry about me. I'm 80 years old. I can't even taste anymore. Or know that that's the same phrase that's being used. But <coughs> even clearer is the other two places that phrase is used is in Ezekiel 22.46. 22.26, I'm sorry. 22.26, it says... Her priests, meaning Israel's priests, have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. Neither have they taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. So it was the priest's job to teach the Israelites the difference of what pleases God, what doesn't, what commandments are, what are not, what's obedience, what's disobedience. And in Ezekiel 44, 23 is the only other time this phrase is used. And in Ezekiel 44, 23, it says, They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the common, and show them how to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. And that's what we have the privilege of doing. When, because of Adam's sin, or original sin, we're born dead in sin. Dead. We have that desire in our heart to come to know God. But the problem is, if you're dead in sin, you're going to worship the wrong God. You're going to worship the God you've made up in your mind. You're going to worship false religion. You're not going to worship the true Jesus Christ of Scripture. Until the Holy Spirit comes in and starts drawing you to Jesus Christ. He opens your understanding, reveals who Jesus is. That's his job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. To exalt and reveal Jesus Christ, the true Jesus Christ of Scripture. And God, he didn't have to, but he does. He uses his church to go out and, and witness of who Christ is. Now, once again, we don't know who the Holy Spirit's working in. And it's arrogant for us to sit there and figure out we know who the Holy Spirit's working in. I just take him for granted he's working in everybody. So every chance I get, I witness to that person about Jesus Christ. Because that person could be the first time, could be the tenth time. They're hearing the Holy Spirit revealing Jesus Christ to them. See, people, you, we all in this room were once trapped in a sinful lifestyle until somebody came and spoke the message to us, the Word of God to us. And then we accepted Christ. We didn't know how else to get out of it until the Holy Spirit opened our understanding and somebody came and preached the gospel to us and we accepted it. That's what it's saying here. 
I want to say uh, depression really fast. Because what's happening to Jonah and Elijah, I'm going to get to Elijah in a minute, is they're going through a depressive moment. That's why Elijah said the same thing. The only two people in Scripture that said this. Elijah said, and it's in 1 Kings chapter 19, starting at verse 3, which we'll look at in a minute. But Jonah, after he had that great spiritual victory against the false prophets of Baal, he runs from Jezebel. And he ends up in the desert and he says, I wish I was just dead. Jonah is saying the same thing here. The contrast is, is that Elijah had a great spiritual victory, and he's upset because it was failure. Jonah's upset because it was a success. Nineveh repented. Think about that, but they're both suffering from a depression. And remember, when Jonah started to turn inward, God came to him. Because what clinical depression is not the same as a brief mood fluctuation or the feelings of sadness. Because, or disappointment, or frustration. It can turn into depression if we allow it to linger and keep inward. Clinical depression has to do with genes and all that. That's from original sins. It's not that person's fault. But I'm talking about when we get frustrated or we're disappointed at some type of outcome and we turn inward. Depression differs from sadness. Because sadness is a God-given reaction to loss that serves to slow people down so they can process grief. Now think about that. See, I'm not talking about depression. I'm talking about just being sad over a loss of a loved one. That's a God-given emotion. It allows that person just to slow down and process the grief situation, go through the grieving process. That's how good our God is. But depression is when we let it linger and we don't move on. We're feeling sorry for ourselves. We're frustrated because it didn't work out the way we wanted it to. Or, or we're disappointed. Well, David, he wrote of his depression. And that was caused by unconfessed sin in Psalm 38 and Psalm 51. God used depression to get Nehemiah's attention in Nehemiah chapter 1 and 2. Job's, obviously, Job's devastating loss led him to curse the day he was born in chapters 1 through 3. And Elijah, which we're going to get to now, was so depressed over the situation of Israel's leaders that he wished to die. But notice what God did to Jonah, and notice what he's going to do with Elijah. He comes to him. He doesn't allow his child to sit in that, stay in that inward position. He says, Jonah, why are you so angry? Elijah, what are you doing here? Because he loves us so much, and we have to be obedient to his voice and get up and go. But I'm going to look at First uh, Kings. That's what I had it open to last time. First Kings, chapter 19, starting at verse three. Then he was afraid. And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Notice Elijah's in the desert. That's where Jonah's at. He's in the desert. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Elijah's sitting under a tree, just like Jonah's sitting under a plant. Elijah, in despondence, requests death. Jonah requests death. But let me go on. And he lay down and he slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked. And behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mouth of God. Then 
There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after a fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? So in verses 9 and 13, God poses the same question twice. Just like he's posing the same question twice to Jonah. And God is communicating through nature. To, to Elijah, just like he's communicating through nature with Jonah. But really fast, his is what the Lord does. Remember, the Lord comes to Jonah when he's starting to get depressed and turning inward. Says Jonah, he starts dialoguing with Jonah. Look what the Lord does with Elijah, just in, in verse 4 through 6. He says, um, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Once again, life has high and lows. And when that, it's just like when the disciples were on the mount, transfiguration, they came down from the mountain and, and faced unbelief. When we have our spiritual highs, which we all do from time to time in this, as a Christian, watch out because the spiritual low is right behind. And that's when we need to seek the Lord when we start getting frustrated or disappointed. But look what the Lord does in verse 5 and 6. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. See, depression can, we probably all have experienced it at some length or some width. Depression can drain energy, twist values, and assault our faith. An angel touches Elijah, confirming to Elijah that he's not alone. Remember when Jesus was, uh, the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness to be uh, tested by Satan for 40 days, and then angels came to minister to Jesus? The Lord's not going to leave us alone when we're starting to get depressed. He's not. He's going to send somebody into our life. But look what he does in verse 6. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. God provided food so that Elijah would gain his strength. And God encouraged Elijah to rest. And I'm just telling you, the God that we worship loves us so much that even when we're Jonah, and we're walking in disobedience and coming out of the will of God, he's not going to leave us there. He's not. He's going to come. And whenever we get depressed and we feel those emotions, we're emotional creatures. God's emotional. We're emotional creatures. He's wired us that way. There's nothing wrong with it. But when we start getting depressed over something, uh, go to the Lord. The Lord's going to reach out to his child to wake you up. Come out. Stop turning inward. Come out. He's going to send people under our eyes. That's what we're doing. Well, when we go out, we meet and visit people. Um, and he knows. That's why doctors are a blessing. He knows what we need for our body. Food, water, rest. And that's why doctors are a blessing. The advancement of medicine is a blessing for us. But I want to end um, one more thing with Jonah. Before we say goodbye to Jonah. <laughs> and that's in verse 10, it says, And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow. And that phrase, made it grow, you did not make it grow. Now, just follow me here. Because I'm telling you, if you're reading this in the Hebrew, the people did 
for thousands of years, they would pick right up on this, which is how the Hebrew language is. But it's the same root as the adjective great, gagrom. It's the same root word. And this means that he's aligning the plant with that great city, Nineveh. He's aligning this situation with the great wind that he cast on the sea, the great storm, the great fish. So what the Lord is saying to Jonah is he's using his, this whole book, this whole situation to teach Jonah things every day. He's teaching Jonah about him and about God. He's teaching Jonah who he is and who he is through these circumstances throughout this book of Jonah. Uh, and he's doing it right here when he says, and the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow. It's through the word of God. He's speaking to Jonah through the word of God. That's how we learn the best, is through the word of God. But he also uses circumstances, actual physical circumstances, like the, him going into the great city of Nineveh. The wind, scorching east wind, east, there's that word again. And the wind and the storm on the sea. He's using these physical circumstances to, to teach Jonah. He's using the word of God, and he's using certain circumstances. So everything that happens to us in life is a teaching moment. Every day we wake up, the Lord's reaching out to us. Every day. He's never silent. And it's the word of God where we probably learn the most, but in every one of our circumstances in life, he's revealing himself to us. He is. That's how much he loves us, and that's how much he loved Jonah.